Hello everybody and welcome to Zero Calvin. I'm Brian and this is my co-host Alexa. Say hello Alexa. Bite me. Sorry about that. I once called her the B word. And she's never forgiven me for it. At any rate, today I'm going to show you how to simulate the look of real wood and metal using a standard 3D printer. Now even though we can use just about any standard FDM printer for this, we will need some special filaments like these. What makes these filaments so special is that they actually contain real wood and metal. Hold on a minute. Are you saying that you are going to simulate the look of real wood and metal using real wood and metal? Very clever. Did you think of that yourself or did someone help you? <sighs> Hello everybody and welcome to Zero Calvin. Today I'm going to show you how to print and post-process wood-filled and metal-filled filaments in a way that makes them actually look like real wood and metal. Because these filaments only contain very fine particles of each material, they do not resemble real wood and metal if you print them in the standard way with no post-processing. In fact, this bronze fill from ColorFab looks more like pottery after it's printed than anything else. But with a little post-processing, it could look like this. Similarly, wood filament looks a lot like 3D printed cardboard after printing, but with a few printing tweaks and some post-processing, we can get it to look like this. Yes, that's right, this chest was fully 3D printed. Everything from the wooden boards, the brass hardware, the steel lock, and the bronze key, all 3D printed. And today, I'm going to show you how to do it. So let's start with the wooden boards. There are two main things that make wood look natural, seeing a grain pattern on the surface and a variation in color. For the grain pattern, we could probably import our model into some kind of 3D software and imprint a grain pattern on the surface using a black and white picture as a bump map. And maybe I'll try that in a later video. But since our parts today are flat, I'm going to show you an easy cheat. I'm sure that you've noticed that wood grain tends to run up and down the longest length of a board, which makes sense since trees are all tall and skinny and their grain runs from top to bottom. I'm also sure that you've noticed that 3D printers tend to leave visible lines on the top and bottom surfaces of a print. As such, we are going to take advantage of this artifact that we usually consider a flaw in order to simulate our wood grain. The only slight problem here is that slicers usually generate the fill at 45 degrees, but we want it to line up with the longest dimension of our part. We can remedy this in one of two ways. The first way is to simply rotate our part by 30 degrees. The reason I say 30 and not 45 is that we don't want the grain to line up perfectly square with our part, because in the real world, the grain is not always lined up. Sending it to something like 15 degrees makes it look a lot less mechanical although the angle is arbitrary, so feel free to use something else, or better yet, mix it up between all your parts. In any case, the other alternative is to leave the part square with the printer and change the top-bottom line directions in Cura to 15,105. Or in Slicer, you would simply change the fill angle to 15. After you've done either method, make sure to check that the grain is going the correct way for both your top and bottom layers. You may have to slightly adjust your layer height in order to add or subtract a layer to get both the top and bottom fill to run along the longest length of your part since each layer alternates by 90 degrees. Okay, enough about slicer settings, let's print some parts. I chose to print the wooden parts on my dual extrusion Ultimaker. Since the wooden filament is both weaker and more expensive than standard PLA, I used some cheap white PLA as the solid infill and only printed the wooden filament for the perimeters, tops, and bottoms. I would have really loved to have done this same trick with the metal filament because it is super fragile and super expensive. But as luck would have it, all my metal filament is 3 millimeters, and this Ultimaker is set up to use 1.75. So I had to print the parts in solid metal using my other Ultimaker and hope for the best. Okay, all our parts are now printed. For the lock parts, I used Protopasta's Magnetic Iron PLA. The name is a little confusing in that it is not magnetic, but it does contain enough iron that magnets will attract it. For the hardware, I went with ColorFab's Brass Fill PLA, and for the key, I used their Bronze Fill PLA. For the wooden parts, I went with MG Chemicals Wood Filament. 
You probably have not heard of the brand, but uh, I picked it up on Amazon, and I'm a big fan of it. It prints very well, and very rarely will it clog my standard 0.4 millimeter nozzle, which some wood filaments tend to do. What's more is this filament takes stain pretty well, which is important for our next step. But before we get to the staining, I just want to take a moment and show you how the raw filament looks with our 15 degree surface lines. Already it's starting to look like real wood. Now all we have to do is give it some streaky wood coloring. For that, I'm using this mahogany minwax wood finish. I find that a dark stain works best because the printed parts are still partially plastic and resist staining somewhat, especially on the top and bottom surfaces. I also found that the perimeters of the print will soak up the stain much more readily. So on a traditional print like this cat that is basically all perimeters, the stain ends up soaking up well and evenly, so the results look more like copper in some lights or chocolate in others. Of course, for both of these parts, I was actually trying to make the stain even, so perhaps a streaky effect can still be done to some degree, but just keep in mind that you are unlikely to get the same effect as you are about to see on these flat parts. Before I started staining, I wanted to test to see if some light sanding would help or hinder the stain's adhesion to the parts. To this end, I wet sanded a spare part and applied stain to both the sanded and unsanded sides. In the end, I preferred the unsanded side better because the sanded side was unnaturally smooth and the stain wiped off of it easier. Of course, I only had 500 grit sandpaper, so perhaps something coarser like 220 would have done better. All the same, the non-sanded side looked just fine to me, so that was one less step for me to do. To apply the stain to the real parts, I used a paper towel and some gloves. Just like with staining real wood, I started out by applying a heavy coating and letting it soak in for a few minutes while I continued to stain other parts. After about five minutes, I used a relatively stain-free paper towel to remove the excess stain from the parts. I actually found that the process worked best if the towel had some stain on it already, but not so much that it was saturated. Otherwise, it tended to be too aggressive in removing the stain from the parts and did not allow the streaking effect that we were looking for. I did the larger parts in much the same way as the smaller ones, although it took a little more time to get the stain into the nooks and crannies of the edges. I found that a light touch on the removal stage worked best and being a little haphazard and careless helped to keep things random. This is definitely a finishing technique that was made for me as this is about the usual level of my finishing skills. At any rate, you should also note that I limited my wipes to the general direction of the grain because the streaking effect this creates helps to reinforce the illusion of grain. So here are our finished wooden parts. I think they turned out fantastic, so now it's time to turn our attention to the metal parts. The first step in processing these parts is going to be the rock tumbler. This one was my father's and has been around for decades. He was a big fan of metal detecting, so he used this tumbler almost daily to clean up his coins and other findings. This baby is so old that it was actually made in the United States out of metal. Seriously though, I just looked it up and uh, this company is still in business and still producing models just like this one in the United States and still out of metal. Go figure, good for them. So hey, if you want a rock tumbler that can last for decades of constant use, uh, you might want to check them out. All right, but anyway, I'm not here to sell you a rock tumbler, so let's get back on point. For the tumbling media, I found that brass screws work very well. The general idea here is to use something hard enough to abrade the plastic off the surface while leaving most of the brass, so brass works well for this. I also added a few stainless bits of hardware to make the media a little more aggressive. This helps to round off the edges and erase most of the layer lines. But this is very much a garbage in, garbage out type scenario. So you want to print the metal parts so that they are as smooth as possible out of the printer and maybe even take some time to wet sand them with something around 500 grit before even putting them in the tumbler. Unless you leave the parts in there for days, the tumbler is not going to hide your laziness or mistakes. Believe me, I know from experience. Now that the parts are sanded, we will put the polishing media into the tumbler along with the brass and bronze parts. We will also want to add some water. I found that it is best not to get carried away with using too much polishing media or water, especially the water. 
If you have too much water, it tends to deaden the impacts between the media and the parts. The idea is to have just enough to keep things lubricated and carry away the debris from the impacts. Speaking of debris, you may want to check on your tumbler after the first hour or so. Open it up and see how things are going so that you can gauge how aggressively it is working. Chances are that everything is filthy from the plastic debris, so you can use this opportunity to flush the tumbler with clean water while being careful not to lose any parts down the drain. You might find that you already have the look you want after only an hour or so, but I find that leaving it running overnight works best for me, so that's what I did here. And here are the parts from the tumbler the next day. You can see that they are smoother and shinier, although not as nice as I would have hoped. In fact, it's hard to even tell the difference between the brass and the bronze. So this is where super fine steel wool enters the picture. The plastic and metal residue from the tumbling process often leaves a dark film on the parts. If you're looking for the antique look, then maybe this is good enough and you can stop here. But for me, I'm gonna go at these parts with some steel wool and make a horrendous mess in the process. So I just go back and forth and use light to medium pressure, nothing fancy and no need to push really hard. You don't wanna scratch up the brass, just get the gungy coating off. I find that it comes off pretty easily and I tend to stick to a single direction just like how I stain the wood, although I'm not sure that it really matters. Here are the finished brass and bronze parts side by side. We can finally tell the difference between them, and they look pretty nice, I think. Basically like cast parts. Now the only thing left to do is the steel parts. I use this stainless steel polishing media for them and let them do their thing overnight. As this was the first time for me doing this process with this filament, I was not too optimistic about the outcome because there is a lot less actual metal in this filament than there is in the ColorFab product. Here's what the tumbler looked like the next day. Mmm, yum. After rinsing the parts and doing the steel wool thing to them, they looked like this. You can see the unpolished part on the left and the polished one on the right. Yes, I was lazy and did not sand them because those faces were not going to be seen, so this was more of an experiment. The one on the right definitely looks a little more metallic, although the effect is subtle. In my tests with this material, I've found that just giving them a wet sanding with 500 grit sandpaper with no tumbling seemed to produce the best results. So that is what I did for this lock's keyway, which is the only visible part of the lock when the chest is closed. So that wraps up all my finishing techniques. Hopefully you learned a thing or two and are now inspired to try it out for yourself. Oh, and speaking of which, there is another neat thing you can do to this iron filament you can rust it. 3D Printing Nerd did a good video on the process that I will link to in the description, but the general premise is to expose the part to a nasty mixture of vinegar, peroxide, and salt. Leaving it wrapped in a paper towels, soaked in this mixture, and then sealed in a plastic bag worked really well for me when I aged this statue of Hephaestus, the Greek god of blacksmithing. He was basically the original maker, and he pretty much made all the cool weapons and such for the other gods. He was also the husband of Aphrodite, the goddess of love, for a period of time, although this was more of a forced marriage, and she cheated on him with Ares, the god of war, quite a bit. But enough about Greek mythology. Let's put this thing together with a little tappy-tap-tap and some gentle persuasion. Okay, all done. So that about wraps this video up, and I hope you enjoyed it.
Now, now that it's done, I'm going to replace the brass hinges and bronze key with something stronger as they are unfortunately way too fragile to actually use functionally. In fact, I broke the brass hinges just from gently pushing them into pre-enlarged holes. As such, I had to print and tumble them again just for this video, but I was too afraid to drill the holes for the hinge pin, so right now the lid just comes off. I'll probably replace them with this copper looking filament I found on Amazon, since it looks metallic but does not contain any metal that will make it weak. Anyway, I think we are done here, so thanks for sticking with me to the end. As always, I'll end by peddling my books. Speaking of which, thank you very much for the many of you who have already purchased my books, and judging by the reviews you've been leaving, you seem to be enjoying them, so that's awesome too. Thanks again, and cheers. This video brought to you by BrianKramerBooks.com. BrianKramerBooks.com for all your humorous science fiction needs.